Extreme views would clash with the country's traditional bias, causing shock around the globe. And with the number of lives lost, it would throw Japan's perspective on disability firmly in the spotlight. My name is Adrian, and welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime. Today we're heading back to Japan to cover the case of Satoshi Uematsu, a man with a vision so callous that it would claim the lives of 19 nameless victims and leave dozens more injured. Now this case is potentially the result of not decades, but centuries of stigma, with a message calling the nation to change their ways moving forward. And so with that said, some context is required. And just to let you know, I post both solved and unsolved cases here on a weekly basis, so if that is your sort of thing, please consider subscribing to Coffeehouse Crime. I also have a very short announcement to share at the end of this video, if you're interested. So pull up a chair, grab a coffee, and sit back. This is the case of Satoshi Uematsu. You've heard it in previous cases, and you'll hear it again. Japan is a country like no other. Despite being smaller than the state of California, Japan is the world's 10th largest country by population, with over 128 million residents. With breathtaking scenery, a fascinating economy, and a culture as rich and diverse as its food, it's easy to become lost in Japan's infinite wonders. But what is often forgotten about when describing Japan are the country's darker characteristics too. And so with that said, before we start today's case, some backstory is required. Japan's citizens are well known for their kindness, peacefulness, and courteousness to others. And although these are great traits to have, its reasoning is a little less kind. Japan is, indisputably, a conformist country. The pressure to fit in with society's standards and expectations are particularly high here. And being seen as anything different to the expected hard-working salaryman can bring great shame to Japanese families. There are many good things derived from this way of living, however. Japan has a relatively low crime rate with thanks to everyone trying to fit in. And pressure in the workplace increases standards across the board too. But at what cost? Mental health is one of them. With one of the highest suicide rates in the entire world, Japan loses over 12 people per 100,000 residents per year. And unfortunately, the casualties don't stop there. With pressure to fit into society, it's often those without the opportunity to fit in that suffer. Bias against people with disabilities runs rife throughout the country. There is around 10 million people in Japan that suffer from physical, intellectual, or psychiatric disabilities, and dementia boosts that figure up to 16 million. But despite these numbers, there is a stark lack of support for these people. Look around the streets of Japan and you'll hardly see any facility adequately set up to help those in a wheelchair. If you're handicapped, you're 27% more likely to be refused a taxi. And if you're simply known to have a disability, the discrimination and stigma can be so strong that your family may even try to hide or disown you. This all started well before World War II. But since 1945, disabled members of society in Japan have been suffering in both silence and shame. Since 1945, over 25,000 disabled citizens from Japan have been sterilized to prevent them from having children, with over 16,000 of those entirely against their will. The government wanted to, quote, purify Japan's population. And despite this law being considered as both heartless and draconian, it only ceased to exist in 1996. In a recent incident in 2018, Japan's government was under fire when they falsely reported 3,700 disabled employees, just to meet quota. And with prejudice running from the very top down, it's no surprise to see how potent Japan's discrimination really is. Today's case is in Sagamihara a city located about 40 kilometers away from Tokyo's central business district. Once used as an area for extensive training by the Imperial Japanese Army back in the 1930s, the city is now better known as an area for manufacturing and industrial production. With an estimated population of 721,000 people, it's now the third most populous city in the Kanagawa prefecture, placed after Yokohama and Kawasaki. And one of the city's residents went by the name of Satoshi Uematsu. Satoshi Uematsu was born on the 20th of January 1990, 
nearby in Tokyo. His father was an elementary school art teacher, and his mother was a cartoonist. At the age of one, the Uematsu family moved from Tokyo to Sagamihara City, where they settled into their permanent home. Satoshi attended a public elementary school before moving on to a junior high school in the area. At school, he was known to be an entertainer, a charmer, and someone who made other people laugh. He was enthusiastic about basketball, and although his grades weren't excellent, he got by just fine. But it was around this time in high school that Shadows of Doubt first started to cast over Satoshi and his behaviour. On several occasions, he was caught shoplifting with friends. And he was also found to be deliberately causing damage to property while drunk. His most alarming altercation with the law, however, was in 2007, when he allegedly pushed over and hit a disabled person for getting in his way at high school. Despite his questionable actions, Satoshi continued his education into private university. He entered the Faculty of Education to major in primary education, aiming to become an elementary school teacher just like his father. But around this time, his parents suddenly moved out of the Uematsu residence to a condo in Tokyo, leaving the house to Satoshi. And although their motive in moving was never clear, it is speculated that many arguments broke out between Satoshi and his parents, eventually leading to a rift in the family. The supposed breaking point to all of this was around Satoshi's tattoo, which covered most of his back. For those of you that aren't aware, tattoos in Japan are another thing that society looks down upon. The stigma around tattoos dates back as far as 720, when they were used to brand criminals that have committed serious crimes. And during the Edo period in the 1600s through to the late 1800s, tattoos were also adopted by outlaws and gangs such as the Yakuza. They were seen as symbols of courage and loyalty, thanks to their pain and permanence. And while views on tattoos in the modern day climate have relaxed marginally, they are still to this day seen as dirty, disrespectful to family, and shameful. Satoshi finally graduated from university in the year 2012 and although his plans slightly deviated into becoming a full-time tattooist and illegally growing cannabis, he failed at both. Around the middle of 2012, he completed formal qualifications towards social welfare, aimed at qualifying him to work in the psychiatric sector. He passed, and by the time December came around, he found himself a part-time job working at the Sakui Yamayurien care facility, also known as Sakui Lily Garden in English. Reportedly, he was hired after telling interviewers that he thought people with disabilities were cute. Satoshi did well in his job, and in April 2013, he was promoted to work full-time at Sakui Lily Garden, eventually being well known as a bright and motivated worker, with plenty of room for growth. But as the months went by, Satoshi's character began to change. In 2014 and again in 2015, Satoshi was caught hitting facility residents, Consequently, he was interviewed by staff several times. And vigilance over Satoshi in the workplace escalated throughout the year of 2015. But on the 6th of February 2016, after another altercation, he resigned from working at Sakui Lily Garden, leaving himself unemployed. And while Sakui Lily Garden was glad to see Satoshi leave, it wouldn't be the last time that they'd see him. We're moving over to Tokyo, and the date is the 15th of February 2016, only two weeks since Satoshi's resignation. Satoshi had actually travelled to Tokyo to hand deliver a written letter to the political figure Tadamori Oshima, the Speaker of the House of Representatives of Japan. And this letter was the first big warning sign to Satoshi's behaviour. Satoshi's written letter was a written request, appealing for the legalisation of ending the lives of those with multiple disabilities. He actually pleaded for disabled patients to be euthanised for the good of the world, and warned that he planned to carry out a murderous attack to boost the world economy and prevent World War III. After signing his name, the letter proceeded to detail an offer to target two facilities housing the disabled, and he went on to appeal for certain conditions in exchange for committing his act. Satoshi actually offered to kill people himself. He also added that staff would be tied up to keep them from interfering, but that they would not be harmed. The act would be swift, and after that, he would turn himself in. He ended the letter with, Now is the time to carry out a revolution, and make a tough decision for the sake of all mankind. 
He then signed it with his name underneath. The letter was handed to Tokyo police, who then contacted Sagamahara police. And only four days later, on February the 19th, Satoshi was arrested, questioned, and then involuntarily committed to a psychiatric hospital. Satoshi's views of disabled people and the crimes he wanted to commit in order to supposedly boost the world economy was nothing short of profoundly immoral. But with him enrolled into a psychiatric hospital, maybe there was now a possibility to unravel and deconstruct his perspective. Tsukui Lily Garden facility was alarmed to hear that their former employee had such views, and so in an effort for protection, 16 cameras were installed across the facility immediately after. But these cameras would only be installed for routine monitoring, rather than for surveillance. And Satoshi's time in rehabilitation would be very short-lived too, because only two weeks later on March the 2nd, he was released by doctors deemed as no threat to society. And that assumption would be a grave mistake. On the 25th of July 2016, Satoshi travelled to Tokyo by bus to pick up his car from the family residence. He then collected various knives, and afterward, he travelled to a home improvement store where he purchased a hammer and a binding band. Satoshi then travelled to Shinjuku, where he rented a room and dyed his hair golden, before meeting a woman at a barbecue restaurant for dinner. There he told her about his letter and his plans, but tragically, she didn't expect he was actually being real, and ignored it. Fast forward four hours to the morning of the 26th of July 2016. At roughly 1.37am, unmonitored cameras at the Tsukilili Garden Care Facility recorded a black Honda pulling up to a back road. The car belonged to Satoshi Uematsu, who emerged from the driver's seat shortly after parking his car. He walked to the car's boot before pulling out a duffel bag full of knives. He then approached a window located at the southeast wing of the facility, and gained entry by breaking it with a hammer. Being a former member, Satoshi knew the area well. Gaining entry from the back allowed him to remain almost entirely unnoticed, and no one heard him break the window either. At 2.10am he made it inside, found the closest staff member, and tied them up and gagged them. He took their keys, and now with full access to the facility, he was able to go wherever he wanted to. And if his previous letter wasn't obvious enough, there was only one reason why he was here. Satoshi made his way from the southeast corner of the facility right through to its west end, going from room to room, one by one, tragically using his knives to murder every disabled person he could find. A lot of them were fast asleep in their beds. And when that wasn't enough, he then made his way to the second floor. With over three years of experience at the facility, he likely knew the exact process that security officers would follow on a usual night, and so he was able to strategically avoid both them and the security office. With over half of the facility's footprint now covered, Satoshi fled the area through a side door located next to the main entrance, before looping around the main building and back to his car. He was seen again by surveillance cameras at 2.50am, only 40 minutes after his invasion, he then got back into his car, and, when he was behind the driver's seat, posted a picture of himself to Twitter, saying, May there be world peace, beautiful Japan. And with his sick fantasy now complete, Satoshi fled the area. Only ten minutes after fleeing, armed police stormed Sakui Lily Garden. A worker had actually spotted a man with blonde hair wielding a blade walking around the facility's grounds. And when they arrived there, they would discover a harrowing scene. 29 ambulances were sent to the facility, and all of them would be desperately needed. Satoshi wouldn't try to avoid being caught either. In fact, less than two hours after posting to Twitter, he handed himself in to his local police station, along with his bag full of knives. And in the morning, police would find his car too. Blood was found on the steering wheel, with blood-stained towels and plastic bags found on the passenger's seat. A partially eaten piece of bread and 1,000 yen bills were scattered all over. 
When police questioned him on the letter, he said yes, that was me, before requesting a new identity and plastic surgery after only serving two years in prison. This didn't work, and Satoshi Uematsu was immediately arrested on the spot. Back at Sakui Lily Garden, the devastation would continue to unfold. Families of the patients rushed to find out if their relatives were dead. And even those that learned their relatives were alive would have to wait days to find out how bad their relatives' injuries were, or even if they would make it. A total of 19 patients at the facility were sadly killed, most of their bodies discovered in their beds. And a further 26 patients were found to be injured, 13 of them severely. At the time of the attack, Satoshi Uematsu was declared as the perpetrator of Japan's worst post-war mass killing, now called to be the Sagamihara Massacre. And later the next day, Satoshi was transferred from the police station where he handed himself in to a high-security prosecutioner's office. Police tried to use a tinted van to conceal his identity, but as he was escorted away, he smiled at all the cameras around him. Police would also raid his family home too, located only a few minutes away from the care facility. There they recovered journals and electronic equipment, and rumours around Satoshi's letter to the government would soon start to spread. But neighbours did express surprise that apparently Satoshi had committed these murders. He was described by them as friendly, outgoing, and a good man. And although some of them did admit that he had changed over the years, no one ever expected him to cause any harm. It was in this moment that a second investigation would begin, looking into the actions and vigilance of police and psychologists who were aware of Satoshi's views. And questions started to circulate around the 16 cameras that were installed in the facility just weeks before the attack. Although they were on and working, therefore recording the entire incident, no one was actually contracted to operate or view these cameras. Both police and the facility failed to react to the warning signs. To add to the frustration, briefings for the families would only begin an entire 10 days after the attack, with information to the health and well-being of the victims being kept in the dark. And the murders of 19 residents at Sakui Lily Garden instantly became international news. In a country that's commonly perceived with very low crime rates, this was a complete shock to many. But one aspect that contrasted greatly between Japan and other countries is that many countries were declaring this to be a hate crime. Japan, on the other hand, with its stigma towards disabled people, failed to report it that way. In fact, not a single Japanese public official ever sought to officially use these words. And to add to this case's disappointment, the victims of the Sagamahara massacre were never officially named either. This wasn't out of respect, but instead was because the majority of the families didn't want the public to know that their loved ones had disabilities. And on the surface, while this move can be seen as a way of protecting their privacy, it could also be a way of keeping people with disabilities out of the public's eye. We're moving forward to Satoshi's prosecution. On the 20th of February 2017, seven months after the attack, Satoshi was officially found mentally competent to stand trial. This paved the way for more severe charges if found guilty. And with Japan accepting the death penalty on severe cases, emotions around Satoshi's fate were high. His defence team said that they were planning to argue that he was mentally incompetent at the time of the crime due to the effects of marijuana. And almost three years later, on the 8th of January 2020, Satoshi would face trial. He pleaded not guilty to the stabbings, however, over 2,000 people lined up outside the courtroom to try and get one of the 26 viewing seats in the public gallery, while media broadcasted from outside. During trial, at no point did Satoshi show any remorse for his actions to the victims. He did however admit that he was sorry to the families, before proceeding to bite a part of his own finger off as an act of apology. The stunt failed to mean anything though, as he continued to insist that there was no point in disabled people living. After an agonising long trial, the verdict was finally made. Satoshi was formally found guilty, with 19 counts of murder, 24 counts of attempted murder, 2 counts of illegal confinement causing injury, 3 counts of illegal confinement, 1 count of unlawful entry, 
and one count of violating the Swords and Firearms Control Law. The prosecution then announced that they were seeking the death penalty, calling his rampage inhumane that left no room for leniency. And on the 16th of March 2020, Satoshi was officially given his sentence to death by the Yokohama District Court. To the date of this video being recorded, Satoshi Umatsu is still alive and in prison. He awaits to be executed from a high security prison cell. When that day will come, however, nobody quite knows, with the effects of the pandemic delaying the process several times. And while I wish I could go into remembrance for the 19 victims of Saku Lily Garden, sadly, I can't, because they have no names and no faces. Take this as a personal feeling, but denying their names and faces is like denying them their humanity. Following other tragic stories from around the world, we remember the victims, what they were like, and what defined them. And through that, their remembrance puts a heavy emptiness to a place that was taken by a killer. Brushing who the victims are away strips them of their worth, and in turn suppresses the attention that's given towards a case. There were no charities on news articles, no hashtags on Twitter, no campaigns on GoFundMe, and the story itself quietened down all too quickly. And while the will of the victims' family members should be respected, the stigma and shame around disabled people in Japan should not be ignored. It's a bias that tragically played a heavy part to this case. Following Satoshi's crime, both Japan and the rest of the world have become more aware of their perceptions towards people with disabilities. But whether Japan will learn from this and from its disturbing past is still yet to be seen. With the Paralympics Games currently set to be performed in Tokyo later this year, opportunities to normalise and improve on perceptions over disabilities are aplenty. So let's see where they go from here. And back in Sagamihara, families and friends still pay tribute to the victims. They lay flowers once a month outside the facility, which was demolished and rebuilt in 2016. And although some of the victims' names and faces have finally been revealed, most are still kept in the dark. Hopefully one day, this type of stigma and discrimination against disabled people will finally cease to exist, and maybe even the case of Satoshi Uematsu will become a vital lesson that was learned along the way. Thank you so much for watching another video today by Coffee House Crime. If you found this video interesting, or if you learned something new today, then please remember to like the video, and if you haven't yet, then please subscribe too. Just a small thing to share at the end of this video, but earlier this week, I received this. I know we've come so far already from 100,000 subscribers, but honestly, I still can't believe it, and I wanted to thank all of you, old and new, for helping me achieve this milestone. Anyway, thank you again for watching today, folks, and as always, I'll be right here, behind this camera, waiting for you in the next one. Until that moment arrives, though, look after each other. Goodbye. Just one small thing to share at the end of this video, but earlier this week, I received this.